Hey friends, as a musician coming from the modular world, I've had the opportunity to use a bunch of different sequencers. What's a sequencer? Well, a sequencer is something that can make musical events happen over a time period. And if that sounds familiar, yeah, Ableton Live basically at its very core is a MIDI sequencer, right? So if you're using Ableton Live now and you've only ever used Ableton to make music, then you're only really familiar with one sequencer. The cool thing about sequencers in general is that each one of them offer you a completely unique way of making music, and that can be an inspiring process. Now, if you didn't know already, there are a lot of sequencers that are already available for Ableton via Max for Live, and I've used a lot of them, but none of them really gripped me or inspired me to make music, to actually make music, until I came across the Seeds Collection by Novel Music, and it is so awesome. So in this video, we're gonna check out Polymath and a couple of the other devices in the Seeds Collection, all right? Let's check it out. <laughs> Okay, so what you're about to hear right now is just notes that are being generated with this polymath sequencer, this thing right here. This is the thing that's making the notes in track one and track two, okay? So let's go ahead and take a listen to what's going on. All right, so you might have listened to this and thought, Hey, that's that sounds pretty cool. It's it's a little busy, but there's there's some evolving things going on. That's pr that's pretty interesting to listen to. Well, this is Polymath, and Polymath is an extremely inspiring and extremely complex and extremely detailed sequencer that allows for incredible compositions to be made. And so, I think maybe the first thing that we should do when looking at this is look at what it's actually capable of, okay? Because I could go through all the different features on this one by one, but that might not actually convey to you what is possible with this thing. So the first thing I wanna do is show you what's possible. So I'm gonna click on this all tracks. At the moment, I have two tracks with notes in them. I have kind of like a lead and a bass line. The lead sounds like this. Okay, and then this is the bass line. Now, when you put them together, we get Really beautiful little line here. Let's go ahead and look at this tab, All Tracks. Now this is one of the many amazing things that Polymath can do. At the moment, we have two tracks here and each one of them have this little slider, okay? I can slide the slider from here to here and what I'm doing is I'm changing the scale, okay, of the actual sequence. If I go to All Tracks and I move this slider, I'm changing the slider on both this, as you can see it's moved, and this track, so all four tracks if I move this master slider here, I'm basically sliding, okay, between these two scales. So take a listen to this, this is really fun. Th these two keys sound really cool. This key kind of sounds like home, and then this key with this harmonic minor kind of sounds like it's uh, it's got a little bit of unrest to it and it resolves to this, so just take a listen. Now, what's cool about this is that these scales are uniform and the same across the entire composition. So if I go back to one and I say, all right, I want scale one to be maybe A and scale two to be maybe G, let's see what happens now. And I can go back. And they're still going to work within my composition because the actual notes that are being selected here are up here, right? Now, if I go back here, I can move these back to what they were before. But what's really interesting about this slider and all these sliders in here is that these aren't actual binary settings, okay? I'm not just going from one to two. I can actually start to introduce some notes from scale two into scale one as I slide the slider this way. So, so take a listen to this. This is a brand new, to me, a brand new way of composing. So do you see how I smoothly went 
from scale one to scale two, I just think that's so interesting, all right? So this is the first thing that I really feel like polymath is bringing that's really new to composition in electronic music, okay? Now something else I wanna show you is this trigger percentage. So all that this does is it says on all across all of the sequences, see there's four sequences in total, I'm only using two, but across all sequences, what is the percentage chance that these notes will actually trigger, okay? So what's interesting about this is if I just let this play, I can bring the trigger percent down, and as I do, we'll get less and less notes, right? So this is really just a basic probability parameter that has a really interesting trick up its sleeve. So let's go ahead and just listen to what happens when I do this. So in terms of generative stuff, this is really fun. Like you could you could listen to this <laughs> on setting 48%, maybe even lower, like, you know, 41%. You could listen to this and it wouldn't really do the same thing twice for a while. But the trick that this thing has up its sleeve that I think is really so interesting is that you can lock this. Okay, so what does that mean? So what lock means is that all the way over here on this side, we're gonna have a completely random, or 41% of the triggers are gonna trigger at any time. But if I turn lock all the way up, it will record those triggers and it'll play the same thing over and over and over again, okay? So we can lock in sequences that we like. Let me show you. Now it's gonna do the same thing over and over again, right? But if I bring lock all the way this way, take a listen, it's gonna be random again. Now what's even more interesting about this lock feature is that the scale feature is still usable, okay? It doesn't lock everything. At the moment, it's just locking this trigger percentage, okay? As well as a couple other features. But for now, this lock is only locking, at the moment, this 41% trigger. So I can go from one to two still, and I can still change my scale. Now, I absolutely love this feature, and I want to show you one more thing. We've got this locked at the moment, okay? But remember, this is also not a binary control. I can start to move this back a little bit this way, and what'll happen is, is it'll start to record some other random hits, and it might take out some other random hits just a little bit. So, so basically, you can think of it this way. Lock is pretty much a variable thing. So all the way over to the right, it's fully locked. All the way over to the left, it's fully random. Somewhere in the middle, it'll start introducing some random notes that you can relock. okay? So you, so really, in a lot of ways, you can play this sequencer in the most crazy new way, right? So check it out. And so did you see what I just did there? You can you can hear those new notes coming in there and those other notes being removed, okay? So I'm using lock to kind of jam with the sequencer and you can do that as well as just change your chord. And this alone is a really, really interesting thing, okay? Now there's a whole lot more that you can do on this macro level, but for now I wanna kind of break down what's actually happening here. I'm gonna turn off the bass and I'm gonna turn off the, the drums that I have right now. We're gonna look at this device. Chronology is this device. Now, chronology is the clock divider that's driving polymath, okay? What does that mean? That means that polymath is not going to know what to do or when to play a trigger or when to start any of these four sequences if it doesn't get a clock signal from chronology, okay? Chronology has four outputs, one, two, three, and four. You can see these four clocks, okay? And they all, they all output multiple things. They'll output notes. You can see here's C1. That's the note that it outputs. And then A, B, C, and D. So what is A, B, C, and D? 
Well, essentially, there's a big busing system for all of the devices inside of the Seeds Collection. Let's take a look at them. So we've got all these different devices here, and they can all talk to each other over this special busing system, okay? And what does this busing system do? Well, it can take MIDI data, and it can send it between all these different devices. So at the moment, you can see that we have one, two, three, four clocks, okay? And they're all subdividing Ableton's 16th clock, okay? And so we can see that they're all going into these clock inputs, all right? So at the moment, you can see that I have C1 and C2, all right? Let's go ahead and see what happens when I just unselect C2, and we're just listening to C1 on track one. Just take a listen. Now, this is a really predictable thing, right? This clock, we can see this clock is the 16th divided by four. So what is a 16th divided by four? Well, it's quarter notes, right? So this is just, you can see it here too, like one, two, three, four, watch this. Two, three, four, right? So we can see that this clock is very basic. It's just a classic quarter note, right? But when we introduce, see, I'm turning on the second clock, okay? Now you can see that these, these different tracks can have different clocks, okay? We can have clock one, clock two, and then on track two, I just have clock two. Clock two is a weird division, right? This is actually dividing into thirds, okay? So look at this clock. See that? Now what's interesting about this is this is where I got that interesting rhythm going on with this sequence. I added clock one and clock two together, and now you can watch this thing go hog wild. So I could make this other clock, for example, maybe a division of five, and I can add this to the sequence, and now we'll get a whole nother rhythm. Right? So that's how this is working, okay? This is a really interesting thing. Now if we listen to track two, I'll just go ahead and mute track one. Track two is this sequence going into this operator, right? So let's take a listen to this. And you can see that because it's just driven by clock two, it's got that triplet division, right? Now what might be fun is to add a seven to this. So this is a, a seventh clock div division. Let's see what happens here. <laughs> so you can see that this is just a totally new way of thinking about these sequences, right? And that's really fun. Another thing you can do is just keep hitting this random button. And what this will do is it'll just randomize the clocks over and over again. And you can randomize your clocks over your sequences. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute this first track and the second track. And let's listen <laughs> to what happens when I hit this random. Now we'll get to more stuff about chronology here in a little bit, but let's get back to polymath. Now that you know how this thing is being clocked, let's take a look at some of the other interesting features. So you might've heard that there's kind of like a, a spray of notes from this first sequence. Let's go ahead and take a look at the actual notes itself. So I'm gonna go back to my first sequence and we're looking at the notes. We can see that there's a part where there's a chord, right? There's one, two, three notes here. Now, every time we get to this, you can hear those three notes are strummed, right? So we've got all these little tabs up here that have to do with the different parameters inside of each one of these sequences. Now, if I go to strum, you can see that where that chord happens, you can see very lightly in the background, there's that chord. I can make those chords strum up. So from the center, it goes fast to slow, okay? So this is strumming up slow, and this is strumming up fast. This is strumming down fast and strumming down slow. So let's go ahead and try to strum down slow. Let's go ahead and add another strum. Let's add another chord. Maybe the first chord could be a four chord strum, and we'll go ahead and make that strum up quickly. I just love it. That is just the coolest thing. And so you can see we've also got all these other parameters here. So I'm doing octaves here. Let's try to shift the octaves around. Maybe we'll go an octave up here, move some octaves around. We also have velocity 
And depending upon the instrument that you're sending this to, what re what's really important is that as you're sending velocity data, you have to make sure that the instrument itself is accepting velocity data and, and doing that. So in this wavetable, we've got the wavetable set up to receive velocity, okay? It's not always like that in every instrument. So you got to make sure that your settings are reflecting that, right? So I've got velocity kind of moving around here. We've got some different octaves. We've got note duration. Now, this is really interesting. If I make these notes long in certain places and short in others, we can get these different kind of rhythms going on. Now with this duration up, you might be thinking, hey, it sounds like there's some other parameters moving, and you're right. If you look over here in mod, this is where some really interesting things happen. So I've actually mod mapped the filter frequency, the oscillator effect too, you can see it grayed out right there, and then the LFO amount. All three of these parameters are being affected, okay? So let's go ahead and we're gonna exit out of these three parameters, okay? We're clearing them out, and let's go ahead and just and look at how that actually works. So at the moment, here's without any modulation. <laughs> So let's go ahead and map this first slot to the filter frequency, and you can see it grays out. And let's go ahead and kind of scramble this up a little bit. Now you might be like, wait, I see, it looks like the knob is smoothly moving even though these are steps. And that's what's so great about this. Not only is this, yes, it's stepped modulation, but what's cool about it is it's got a release time. Okay, so it takes 361 milliseconds to go from this step to this step. So these parameters are moving slowly. If I make this go faster, for example, all the way to one millisecond, the fastest it'll go, it'll now be stepped. <laughs> Let's go ahead and move this back up. Pretty sweet. I'll move this around a little bit more. Now we can go ahead and map number two. Let's map that maybe to warping and see how that works. Now you might think, well, that frequency is kind of low. Well, another thing we have is a minimum and maximum. So I'm gonna take this minimum, and maybe move it up to 50%, and I'll go up to 100 with max. <laughs> might be a bit much. Let's bring it, bring it down just a little bit. Let's go ahead and map the third one. We'll map that to maybe the sub amount, so sub gain. And as you can see, each one of these have different release times, so maybe I'll make this one's release time a lot higher. Now another lane that we have is bend, and bend is really cool. What bend allows us to do is, is we can pitch bend steps, okay? Each one of these steps can have a slightly different altered pitch. Listen to what this does. So without any of it, listen to this. I can start to microtonally shift this around a little bit. Take a listen to how different this will be. Oh. It's awesome. <laughs> it's so cool. And what's rad about this is that, I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of zero this out. Something else that you can do with any one of these parameters is you can use this deviate control. Now what deviate does is you have a percentage of triggers that will actually deviate, okay? What does deviate mean? It means that it will start to move away from these static settings. So at the moment, for example, let's go to octave, okay? We can deviate from this initial octave. If we listen to the sequence now, it sounds like this. Right, no octave shifting. If we turn the deviate up though, what it's saying now is that 50% of the time, it'll go plus or minus 12 steps. So we'll get a couple lower octaves and a couple higher octaves 50% of the time. So let's just say that deviate does something that I like. If you look down here, doesn't this look familiar? Here's our lock control. And as you can see, the lock, the main lock control of the entire sequencer down here will lock all of these different parameters depending upon their deviation settings, okay? So when you get a repeat that you like, you can lock it in there, right? So let's go ahead and do that. 
I'm going to set some deviations on these different things. On bend, of course, I can go up or down 10% in pitch, okay, every time it's deviated. So this can, you know, introduce some weird microtonal stuff. We'll go back to strum. Maybe we'll add some, some random strumming here and there. We'll change the duration. I'll turn the duration down a little bit like this. And then we'll say, okay, we'll add, yeah, 400 milliseconds to the duration 47% of the time. Do you get how this works? And we can also do this to notes, okay? So here we are at notes. I'll say maybe 25% of the time we could go up or down five steps, all right? And finally, let's go to mod and we're gonna deviate our mod. So these mod destinations here can be deviated by 33%, 30% of the time, okay? I know this is a little nerdy, but now that we've got this set up, look at what can happen. Radical. That is just so cool that you can lock in all of these different deviations or basically random parameters. You can lock them all in with this little lock thing. Now, maybe some of you have heard of the, the Turing machine. It's a really common, really, really awesome sequencer in the Eurorack world. This is a very common feature of that. I can leave it totally locked in and then introduce different random results and keep those locked in. This is a really musical way of working with random generation, right? So take a listen. <laughs> See how it's the same thing? I'll go ahead and add this bass back into here. Now you might be wondering how I'm sending signal to this bass. Well, if you look at track two, you can see, check this out. We have a setting where we can go from monophonic to polyphonic. We have a setting where we can choose to send the MIDI signal out of the plugin. At the moment, it's only sending an output out of track one. See how out is turned, is turned on in white? In track two, I've turned it off because I'm sending it out one of these A through Z buses, okay? And then an operator, this track two, this is where I tell it to receive that MIDI. So here we are uh, on track two and we've selected E. Okay, so you can see we're outputting E on this track, track two, outputting E. And then on this track, we're receiving E and it's playing this operator with a couple of effects. Okay, so listening to this, now you might be looking at this and being like, wait, this only has seven notes in it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps in the sequence, or we can see that the position says seven. Now, what this does is I can shorten or lengthen this sequence itself. But you might be wondering, every single time a bar happens, this repeats itself, even though it's not subdivided perfectly over a full bar. Well, that's because I have this reset feature set on. Let's turn reset off. Now take a listen. Now that sounds like a seven step sequence repeating itself, right? But what you can do is you can reset the entire polymath sequencer to a bar or to however many beats you want. So in this case, three beats. Take a listen. Right? So you can get this to reset in really interesting ways. I find that using bar is really, really awesome. Using just a bar, I can get kind of these really musical results and these interplays between these these sequences. Now, another thing I can do is I can also make the position very short. So let's say I only want these four notes in the bass line. Nice. And our full <laughs> strange ass composition we have here is this. Yeah, that's Polymath and the other devices within the Seeds collection from Novel Music. And I gotta say, that's a really well-named company because this is pretty novel stuff. The kind of stuff that you can come up with this is stuff that you may not have thought of yourself. And that's what's so awesome about using these kinds of sequencers. You might think, well, 
yeah, you know, I'd rather just kind of play directly. And that's cool if that's your style, if that's something that you want to do. But every once in a while, I find myself just wanting to be inspired. And so in a lot of ways, when you're messing with these parameters and you're getting these random results to happen, as well as results that you intended to have happen, such as the key, right, such as the rhythm, all of a sudden, these new ideas will emerge and you'll just get re-inspired to actually maybe even finish your tune, right? And remember, this is just generating MIDI. I could always go in here, right? I could make a new MIDI track and I could say MIDI in from Wavetable, right? And then I could just record the output. And there, I've captured the MIDI that this polymath outputted, right? And so I can use that MIDI to compose other things. So awesome, I'll put a link to this Seeds collection down in the description and in the comments. And if Ableton's your thing, it's my thing too, so make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. I'll see everybody next time. Thanks for watching.